want to apologize also for my um, clickbaity title. Um, uh, I guess when, uh, when, when people who are not in the, the field of computer science think about machine learning and artificial intelligence, it's, all, it's, it's, kind of a bit, it's, it's a big confusing subject. And one of the questions that I get asked by friends and family is uh, things like, you know, when are the robots going to come? When are they taking over? When are, when are we going to all lose our jobs? And this talk isn't really about that. This talk is uh, going to be quite a practical talk about machine learning. But I do want to just quickly discuss some of these, some of the kind of big ideas around artificial intelligence um, and see what you think about it. So the first point, which I think most of you are all very aware of, you know, is that uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning are not the same thing. Machine learning is, is just one field in this big area. Uh, so the, uh, the area, I uh, apologize for the slightly uh, squashed display. The area of uh, artificial intelligence includes many subjects, like, and, uh, and machine learning is one of them. But also things like uh, natural language processing, machine translation, robotics, it's, 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 a, it's a very big field. But when people think about artificial intelligence, often what they're, what they're thinking about is um, what's, what we sometimes call artificial general intelligence. And uh, a book that I, I really recommend on the subject is Life 3.0 by Max Tegmark. Has, has anybody read this book? No? Um, Max Tegmark is uh, he's a physics professor at MIT. Uh, he's given a lot of talks on this, and uh, this book was a very good primer for me for, for understanding the, the, some of these issues. And as you see, it's called Life 3.0. And his, uh, his, his thesis is that um, there have been, there will be three stages of, of life. And the first was the kind of the, the basic um, the basic kind of elements of biology. So this is, uh, you know, like a, a bacteria or a, or a chicken. And, uh, and in life 1.0, then uh, creatures, both their hardware and their software evolve incrementally. So very kind of tiny amounts, every generation, uh, you know, across tens of thousands of years, the chicken might get a little bit stronger, a little bit faster, it might get a tiny bit more intelligent, but, but, but perhaps not. Um, and, uh, and, and in life 1.0, creatures have no control over their, over their destinies. And then life 2.0 is, uh, is the arrival of the human. And with the human, with our, our, our bodies, we're not, able to, uh, we're not able to transform our own bodies. Um, we just have to wait for, uh, for evolution to, to gradually improve them generation by generation but we are able to design our own software and that's that's what makes us special so uh, we as humans can decide to learn a new language or uh, to, to play a musical instrument or to, to master a sport or even to, to learn a learn how to program computers and to, to you know, create create new uh, intellectual ideas, and this is a, this is this is a significant step forward, and, and that's why that's why you know humans have basically won. Uh, there's an interesting point where he talks about also like 2.1, where uh, increasingly humans are able to just sort of adjust bits of our own hardware, so uh, we can't transform our bodies, but we can replace our knees when we get old, or uh, give ourselves new teeth. But that's that's a uh, that's a kind of small point really. And then the big one is uh, life 3.0. So with life 3.0, uh, this this new uh, this new entity will be able to design its own software in the, in the way that, that we can, but we'll also be able to design its own hardware. So it'll be able to create better versions of itself. And unfortunately, life 3.0 is uh, is not human. Life 3.0 is, uh, that is that's the robots. So this is when the when the computers are able to, uh, to, to to make better computers than humans can make computers. And in order to, to get to this point, we have to achieve 
what is uh, often referred to as AGI, Artificial General Intelligence. So machine learning and all the other aspects of uh, artificial intelligence that I was talking about before uh, are all very specific. So we know how to make a computer program that can beat a human at chess. And we, we just about know how to make a car that can drive better than a human. But these are, these are very kind of focused activities. What, what we as humans are good at is, uh, is we have a very, very broad range of skills. So, you know, all those languages I was talking about, probably in this room, we can probably speak 10 languages and play 10 musical instruments and have expertise across, you know, a very wide range of fields and cook delicious types of food. And, you know, we're, 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 we're generalists. We, we can, we're very versatile. Uh, and, and the huge challenge for computer science is to recreate that, that versatility in computers. But it will come. And, uh, and there's, a, there's, a, there's a lot of debates in, in this area of artificial intelligence. And some experts say that, in fact, artificial general intelligence may never be possible. Um, that, uh, that the way that humans think is, is impossible to replicate. But, but there are more who think that it, that it is possible. And there's, there's no consensus about when this, gonna, this is going to happen. But in the most recent poll of all the experts working in this field, the average time at which the ex experts think that we will hit artificial general intelligence is in 30 years' time, so around 2050. Which is a pretty, pretty phenomenal thought. So if these, if these predictions are right, then we are standing on the absolute cusp of, of you know, one of the most dramatic changes that has, has perhaps ever happened in our civilization. And it's a strange feeling that life 1.0 started roughly 4 billion years ago, uh, and then life 2.0 is 100,000 years ago, the arrival of the human. And then uh, life 3.0 is within, an, within most of our lifetimes. Uh, and so, Either this is just a kind of coincidence that we happen to be living in this moment where this huge change is going to happen, but also I would just remind you that um, throughout history, throughout throughout millennia, there's always been this idea of like a, a, you know a forthcoming apocalypse, a forthcoming change in the world. You know, it's a, it's a very common theme running through history. So it could just be that we're we're playing out this this theme ourselves, but the evidence is that this shift is coming and uh, that it's going to be it's something important for us all to, to, to think about. Okay, so that's the end of the big, uh, the big kind of scary robots bit and the rest is about a very um, practical way of looking at using these machine learning tools. Uh, and I should say that this is a much less expert level talk than uh, some of the amazing talks that, that happened yesterday and will probably happen today. Um, like uh, the Susie Lee's keynote yesterday, which I found absolutely fascinating. My talk is is not about understanding machine learning concepts from the bottom. It's about how we can use the tools that are now very readily available to us as Python developers in order to make dramatically different types of applications. So I'm going to start with a with a definition of machine learning, and this is from. Uh, one of my favorite authors on this subject, Francois Cholet. He's the uh, author of Keras, which is the, uh, the Python uh, deep learning library. He works at Google. And um, I just find everything he says is clever and funny. And uh, so I, I recommend following him on Twitter and, and reading his books. Um, his definition is, is really nice. So uh, classical programming, so the, the, the kind of programming that we learn as, as, as new Python developers or developers in any language uses rules and data to, 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 to produce answers. So we work out, we, we will look at modeling something based on our uh, kind of real world understanding and, uh, uh, and we'll, we'll take data and then, you know, and then we'll combine this and we'll produce answers. Whereas machine learning uses data and answers to produce rules. So with machine learning, take your, the data that you have, you take the answers that you know are true, you combine them all together, 
you send them off to the, the black box and, uh, and it creates the rules for you. And then you can measure the rules and refine them and then start using them. I think this is, this is a really, really helpful definition. And this is the book by Bartholomew that, that helped me understand some of the stuff. And uh, if, you're, uh, if you're interested in getting into machine learning, I, I thoroughly recommend starting here. And it's, uh, it, it's based on Keras, which is his library, but it's, um, all, the, all the techniques are applicable across different frameworks. All right, so I'm going to look at uh, a few key techniques that we can start using with machine learning right now in our applications. And the first one is image recognition. This is the one that I think tends to be kind of excite people the most. So if you start, if you if you study computer science and uh, you might do a course on machine vision, and uh, the kind of basics of machine vision are that you um, you might have a camera or take an image. And, uh, and you might start with OCR, optical character recognition. So you have some text and, um, and you work out how to identify the, that image of text and to convert it into, into a string. And you'll do that by, by, by rules. So you start by cleaning up your image a bit and then you'll see you know, that if it's got kind of a line like that and a line like that, um, then, it, then it's probably an A. And you, kind of, you start working out the rules. And, and I think you know that, that that's that's a bit like the uh, that, that Francois Cholet's definition about um, classical programming. But then with machine learning, we're able to just to get thousands of images and to uh, to tag them to 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 identify to to, uh, to to manually write describe what they are uh, to classify them and then to create a model out of that. And this is something that. Uh, even like six or seven years ago, seems like a fantastical feat. So the ability for a computer to, to see, to, to, take a, to take a photograph taken from any angle and to identify its contents, even a few years ago, seemed like an extraordinary thing to do. And you can imagine that, you know, the millions of lines of code that you would need to do that and, and the data that you would need to do that. But now, in order to, to identify an image, you can write it in 10 lines of code. And uh, I'm sorry for people sitting in the back who, who, uh, for whom this isn't going to be easy to read. But the point about these lines of code is that there's nothing really clever happening here. So this is just talking to an API. And uh, in my experience, the, the hard bits for these APIs are reading the documentation to work out how to do the authentication, because each of the services has different authentication. But you, uh, you get your key. In this case, I'm using the Microsoft uh, machine visual service. You, uh, you, you send your key using the request library, you send it off to the API uh, along with your URL, and then you take your response. And most of the code that I'm going to show you is about calling an API, taking the response, and then just uh, dealing with data structures in order to extract the fix that you want. So often it's, it's 10 to 15 lines. Uh, so, so this is a small, a very simple site that I, I built in, Jane, in, uh, in Python, uh, in order to demonstrate some of these uh, some of these features. So starting off with image recognition, I'll start with um, here's an image. So I take a public image. What? Can everyone see that? What, what does that look like? An image, Aldrin? Uh, <laughs> some kind of bird. I don't know what kind of bird it is. But I'm going to uh, I'm going to paste that in here and hit describe. And now it's uh, running those 10 lines of code. And a person holding a bird. Pretty good. OK, here's a, here's a harder one. This is my colleague, Colin. He's, uh, he's, a, he's a very nice man. He's uh, one of our uh, DevOps team. He doesn't actually, in real life, he doesn't have uh, like big ears <laughs> like that or a nose. Um, but uh, this is a more challenging picture, so we'll Try that. <laughs> All right. Also, also, you know, not not entirely accurate, but you can see that it's uh, you know, it's, it's, it's made a good effort. And I guess this is the, the the thing here is that. Um, it's just, gonna, it's just depending on the, on the models that it's got. And uh, Microsoft Service, I found, is, is the best of the, 
the various cloud services. But of course, it probably doesn't have yeah in its uh, in its training model. It probably doesn't have many pictures of tall men with red beards and uh, and rabbit ears. So I thought for this uh, for this talk, I would try something a bit different as well. And um, so I just adapted my uh, app to try to take a live picture of this camera. So I'm going to see if it's going to identify you now. Right, here you are. Okay, ready? Okay, I click the picture, sends it away. A group of people sitting posing for the camera, so that's pretty good. I'm terrible at JavaScript. This is that was the hardest bit for me was uh, capturing the uh, capturing the, the camera into the browser. So that's uh, this is it's kind of an interesting demo, but I think there are some uh, there are some really practical applications for these kind of tools as well. Um, and the first might be content management. So that's the area that I'm, I am spend most of my time thinking about. Um, I'll show you a demo, a content management demo in a minute. Also accessibility. So uh, you can imagine that as these services get better, uh, you could build a tool. I mean, I expect something like this exists already. So that um, uh, as, as somebody with, with bad sight or, or, or with, with visual impairments, you could build a tool that, where you can Point a point a phone at something and, and have it identified for you. Uh, often, um, if you run a service where uh, you you allow people to upload images, one of the risks is that people will upload images that are, that are inappropriate, that are not safe for work. And again, it's quite hard to, to kind of create rules that define what's not safe for work. But it's easy to get a, a computer to, to tell you. And uh, most of these uh, cloud-based vision services. Have some kind of uh, have uh, will respond to say whether or not the uh, this picture is not is safe for work. So here's a demo in a in a content management context. Uh, this is the UI for Wagtail. Do I have any? Yeah, here we go. Um, so this is our, our content management system. And I'm selecting some images from my desktop and dragging them into Wagtail, the content management system. And uh, this is normally where I edit the titles. But here you can see that the titles have been filled in for me. So it says a red plate, it's moving very fast. A herd of cattle walking across a parking lot. Uh, a black and brown dog. Uh, a, view, a view of a tall building. Um, that one's not so good. There was a plate of sardines and it says a white plate covered in snow. But I guess the. the and, and, and that's using the same service, so it's just plugging into that Microsoft Vision service. And I guess the point here is that, um, as we can see, it's not perfect. So it's uh, it's uh, a lot of the time, when, especially when it sees images which are less usual, then you'll get an answer which is not good enough. But I think if you use it in this model where it's augmenting the editor experience, where it's helping people make make choices more quickly, it can be a really useful tool. So if you're running a site with tens of thousands of images or or a lot of content happening at the same time, using these tools to speed up the process of tagging it to provide all text uh, feels like a, a, a useful technique. Um, this is a, this is an extra bit that, uh, that I wrote that I, I did in the last week. Um, and although this is not really to do with uh, practical machine learning services, I was. Uh, I've been interested to see in the last week there's there've been um, a few of these uh, image generation techniques. I don't know if anybody saw this site. Uh, I think this is this is not a real person.com. And every time you refresh the page, it creates a new human being. So uh, that is not a real person. This is but you you, you learn to spot the, uh, the, the 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 error. So I don't know. This is a bit tricky for people to see, but. You might see that the tooth looks a bit weird. There's a kind of one sort of central tooth, and for some reason the teeth are hard at the moment. And then around the edges, that's clearly not right there. I mean, you don't notice at first because you look straight at your face. Um, and I think it's going to be increasingly important for us to understand and to, to, to try to be able to identify these fakes. Um, here's another one. They, uh, so, like three days after someone built the, this, the this is not a human site. Someone made a this is not a cat site, which is much uh, less successful. Um, cats, cats are harder apparently. 
All right, so the, the next up on our, um, on our practical machine learning services is sentiment analysis. Um, there, was a, there was a fantastic talk about this yesterday by uh, Gwen Neal Ebo, um, who, uh, who talked about um, one, of the, one of the issues is that um, most of the training models of sentiment analysis are uh, for English, English and French. So uh, and he was describing how, how to make this uh, how he, his techniques for making this available in different languages. Um, but the, the point of sentiment analysis is to take some text and to work out what, what we think the author is feeling. And again, uh, in order to do this quickly, we can use 10 lines of code. So for the last service, I used the, the Microsoft Vision API. Incidentally, my, the reason I chose the Microsoft one is because that's the only one that does descriptions. All the other services will give you tags, which is probably the most useful thing most of the time, but uh, the des descriptions are currently only from Microsoft. This is from IBM's Watson API, so um, uh, IBM uh, have really focused on chat, chatbots, and um, uh, and the, the kind of their Watson product has been a lot about um, uh, trying to create realistic human interactions. Um, so again, you have to you submit your username and password. Uh, they have a basic API, and you get back the, the type of the document. So let's do a demo for this one. Okay, so in my feedback box, I'm going to write uh, the food values. Wonderful. And I guess a tone of joy, which is right. I do, I, I, I do feel joyful when I uh, when I eat this delicious food in Manila. And then it's, a, it's a confidence score, so 0 0.92. Uh, traffic in Manila is awful. And this time I get a score of anger, which isn't quite right. I wouldn't say I was angry about it, but uh, uh, you know, immediately we're getting some sort of useful results from here. Uh, somebody asked um, after Gwen Neal's talk yesterday about sarcasm. And I think this is uh, something that I haven't, I haven't found any of the services hand deal with this really well. Even if I put a smiley afterwards, I still get anger. It doesn't seem to make any difference. Um, uh, but also, I mean, I think this is this is this is pretty. They're pretty hard. It's pretty hard. Even if I say uh, was awful, but isn't now, I'm still getting a negative score. And I think that's because I imagine that the Watson API is, is, gen is looking for terms. So, you know, I've still got awful, and I've got isn't, and, you know, it's still, it's still general negative terms. So uh, I think this, there's, there's a way to go on this. Um, I must say, I haven't been super impressed with the, uh, the accuracy of the, of the Watson API so far. Um, but I think, and I, I think I would, uh, of all these APIs, this is the one that I would rely on least. But I think it might be relevant if you're looking for trends. So in terms of some um, practical in, uh, applications of these technologies, one of the classic use cases is customer support. So if you're dealing with um, uh, feedback from your customers and, uh, and you've got too much feedback in order to, to process manually, you could use a tool like this to help you identify what proportion of your customers today were happy and which weren't. Or you might use it, um, you might set a threshold, a, a, an anger threshold here, and you say, if it's over 0 0.8, then I want to get an alert about it so I can deal, deal with it myself. Um, uh, skipping to the end, I think one of the, one of the best cases is, is better bots. So um, if, you are, if, you're, if you're trying to build a bot, a chatbot, uh, um, or, or yeah, telephone-based, or voice-based, or a chat-based bot, uh, then one part of the, the the task is to be able to express yourself in a in a realistic and appropriate way. But in order to express yourself correctly, you have to be able to listen correctly. So, as as humans, we, we learn how to do that. If someone says something to us that, that and we understand how they feel, then we're able to respond appropriately. Uh, so, using this kind of sentiment analysis to try to judge the, your response. Can be a helpful tool, I think. 
we're using we're starting to use this for one of our projects at the moment so we work with an organization in the uk called samaritans um, they provide uh, they're a very famous organized charity in, in, in the UK, they provide support for people who are feeling desperate, and particularly for people who are feeling suicidal. And uh, so if, um, for the last 50 years, if you feel like suicidal, then um, you, you, you would call a number which is very famous in the UK and speak to someone. But people don't really use the phone so much anymore, particularly kind of 18 to 30 year olds in the UK, and I'm sure here, people do not tend to use the phone very much. And uh, so the Samaritans need to adjust to this, and we're helping them build a chat tool instead to, to do live chat. And this is something my colleague built that uh, uh, does an analysis during the chat process. So you can see, as the conversation goes on, whether the trends are tending towards more positive or more negative. And this, at the moment, this is, not, this is not data that we would make decisions about, but it's data that the organization could, could use to, to, to measure the, uh, the effectiveness of their, of their services. Okay, moving on. Uh, the next one is entity extraction. So th again, this is a, this is a kind of a classic task in machine learning, uh, and it's really about what, it means what, what proper nouns. What, what are the what are the main themes of this piece of content? Uh, again, this is this is code that would could take you many thousands of lines to, to do correctly, um, to, to, to do manually, and uh, and even then, for reasons I'll show you later, you, you, you might not have a, a very high quality of result. But with with 10 lines of working out the API and sending your data in response, you can get some pretty good. So I've, I've copied uh, this description text from, the, uh, from this beautiful website. and I send off my extraction. And here are my results. Uh, so we can see that um, the, the highest score is that this is about PyCon APAC, and um, there are some lower scores referencing the, the different countries that this text is about. And one interesting feature, this is using the Google's natural language service with the entity extraction. One interesting feature is that Google will identify Wikipedia pages for, uh, for each of these subjects. And actually, I think this is the most impressive thing about this result, is that um, Google has identified that PyCon APAC refers to a Python conference in Wikipedia. And even by changing a little bit of the, the text, so if I leave the first part, and we'll just extract that first sentence, we see that it's still called out Py PyCon APAC, but it hasn't identified it as a Python conference. So it's using the context around it, the fact that it's a, a regional conference that it used, and then the conference conference is referenced here. It uses the the context uh, to to make these decisions about entity extraction. This is a, perhaps you know the least glamorous of these uh, of these various tools, but I think one that, that could have the most practical use, or, or is at least there there are many immediate practical applications for a service like this. And content management is another one. Um, I'll show you a demo in a minute. Also, I think um, uh, plagiarism tests. So this is becoming an increasingly important issue uh, in, in, in study and learning. That it's, uh, it's very easy for students to, to steal content and to reuse uh, essays. And using um, entity extraction will give, you, you could build a tool that uses an entity extraction to <coughs> Uh, to, to, to give you quickly measures of similarity between documents and to uh, identify fraudulent or, or plagiaristic documents. So here's another demo, um, again using Wagtail. And in this demonstration, just zoom in a bit. Uh, in this demonstration, I'm creating a, a new page uh, about the film Moonlight, which uh, won some of the Oscars last year, and I've just taken some text from Wikipedia, and and having saved it, uh, the tags about that content have automatically been applied. So using this entity extraction service, I've, it's uh, it's generated the tags, and we can see as I preview the page, the tags are uh, 
at the bottom of the page and I click on that tag page and this the, the one page that I've just created about Moonlight. And now I'm going to create another page also about Moonlight using some different content, um, uh, adding an image and uh, this is some content from a completely different article and uh, I'll add a YouTube video as well. And then when I save this page in the content management system, again, it will extract the tags. We can see the tags at the bottom. And one of the tags is of Barry Jenkins, who is the director of this film, Moonlight. So now if I look at this page live, I can see the article about Barry Jenkins and, and the film. And we see the tags at the bottom. And we click on Barry Jenkins. And now we have a new page, which uh, which didn't exist before in the content management system. So this is a page that's been created by the tags, and this is allowing users to, to browse through the content thematically um, using themes which, which the editor might not even be aware of. So if you have a, a website with 100 pages, then the editor probably knows how the different articles are related. But if you have um, uh, a new site with 100,000 or 100 million pages, it's going to be impossible for a human to, to know how, how all of these, uh, how these content is all connected. And using a tool like this, you can very quickly uh, generate these kind of more natural thematic browsing experiences. The last of the services is around prediction. What will happen next, given what we know in the past? And this is really the kind of, like the basic machine learning services that, that are, um, the kind of training models that, that, that are at the heart of what we've been talking about in, in this conference. As many of you know, and many of you are much more expert than me on this, there are there are a few like, core steps that you need to 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 do. And, and even with the uh, with the, with these cloud services, these are still requirements. So you will still need to prepare your data, and you'll still need to send it off for training. Here's a, a quite a classic um, training data. Um, this is about 100 animals. Um, this is familiar probably to some of you who, who've done these kind of machine learning tutorials. And um, we have, uh, on the left hand side, we have the name of the animal, and then we have their features. So in machine learning, the features mean the, the different aspects of, the, of, of, of an object that you want to, you want to uh, train. And, and the very last column is, uh, is it's just a number, but it's a classification. So, the, the task that we want to be able to achieve from doing this is to be able to work out what type of animal a new kind of animal, uh, an unknown animal might be. So the first part is preparing your data, which generally means getting it into some format where you, 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 you will get the, the features to be ideally binary on or off. Uh, while, I was, um, while I was preparing this talk, I came across this, uh, this tweet by Vicky Boykis, uh, because I was, the, the hardest bit of, for this for me was getting through, understanding the, uh, reading the AWS documentation in order to, to send up my, my, my training data. And I came across this, which I thought was interesting because uh, she said the hottest programming skills include getting info from AWS documentation, but I also managed to uh, include it into, I also managed to combine that with number one of uh, turning it into a conference tool. So once you've prepared your data, you upload it to, to the AWS um, prediction engine, and you classify your data. Um, there's uh, uh, an easy mistake to make would be to AWS will try to guess the different types of model, and um, and it, it guessed everything correctly apart from the last one. So it, it thought the last the class type was numeric, um, which would suggest that uh, you know, for example, a mammal a mammal is sort of somehow more than a reptile. But it's a, it's the last one is a classification, not a number. And then you define the type of model, and then it's available for us to use. So AWS immediately turns it into a, a web-based service that you can that you can query. So who can uh, who can suggest an animal for us to try out? What was that? All right, I, I don't know what, that's, that's good, that'll be a good test. So, you, I don't know this animal, so you have to tell me the answers. Does it have hair? Yes. Feathers? No. Eggs? 
Milk? Yes. Sure? Yes. Is it airborne? No. Is it aquatic? No. Is it a predator? Is it toothed? Yes. Does it have a backbone? Yes. Does it breathe? Yes. Is it venomous? No. Does it have fins? No. Does it have a tail? Yes. Is it domestic? No. Is it the size of a cat? No. Is it a mammal? Yes. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> right, that's a relief. So that's a pretty simple example, but you can see how easy it is to, uh, to, to create these services. And then uh, once you've uploaded the training data, Amazon immediately makes it available as an API that's very easy to call. So all that kind of infrastructure stuff of having to make your model available somewhere and uh, <coughs> creating an interface for it is done for you. And there are many practical applications of this kind of um, prediction service. And I guess the the one that people talk about most in the commercial world is audience segmentation. So, um, if uh, if you're on a website and you're uh, you've carried out a set of actions, then we 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 can use tools like this to, to predict what you might want to do next. So you take all your log data from from previous interactions and you say people who visited these kind of pages and uh, used this kind of browser ended up. Uh, buying this kind of product or uh, choosing this kind of outcome, and then so and then you can make that data, you can save that data, and create a model on AWS, and then uh, call it using this API and do automatic segmentation in real time. Um, in uh, in my world, where we're, we're most of our clients are nonprofits, we're thinking more about donation dollars. So we, we we it's kind of important for us to know what's the right amount of money to ask. Um, and uh, and that might depend on how whether they've landed on the site through Google or uh, whether or, or the kind of thing they've been searching for. Um, uh, it might even depend on what kind of browser they're on. So if you're on a mobile device, it's probably less likely that you're going to pay a large sum of money in one go, or that you'll set up a, a, a recurring payment. Um, and so we want to adapt to that. So because. Uh, increasing the chances of someone making a payment is going to be more valuable than kind of seeking the highest amount all the time. I do want to just kind of make some warnings about using these services as well. And and, and, and I thought this, this this is really interesting in yesterday's talk by uh, the, the keynote by Susie B. Um, so you might spot that most of the bees in this are uh, most of the animals created starting with B are one are mammals. And if you just give your data. To a, to a computer to, to, to try to work out the answers for you, then it will it will try and extrapolate as much as it can. This is what this is known as overfitting in machine learning, and and so a computer might think that um, animals beginning with B are more likely to be mammals than not. And we know that's not true. That's just a that's that's a coincidence. But this is a mistake that happens surprisingly frequently. Um, this was a story from about three or four months ago. Uh, where Amazon had created a recruiting tool, um, and uh, what they wanted was an engine because you know they're, they're dealing with a lot of applicants for their for their positions all the time. They wanted an engine where you could um, just feed it in in resumes and CVs, and it would spit out the right ones. It would tell you who who, who they think are the best people to bring through. Uh, another another one. So there's a, there was a famous blog post about this um, a few months ago, uh, using the um, if you create a, your own sentiment analysis engine, then you can take, there are a lot of free data sets that you can use. So you can use news data sets that have already been tagged with, the, that have um, uh, the terms involved, and then have already been tagged with negative and positive responses. And it's very, very quick to be able to demonstrate that by using these widely available sources, you can create, um, Sentiment analysis engines that are racist, that uh, that will give a, a, a negative response for, for different cultures and even for different names. Um, I guess the point here is that, uh, and, and and then you get you get these headlines in the popular press saying you know AI is racist, and of course computers are not racist or prejudiced or sexist, but humans are, or at least humans have been, and 
we have to be really careful that when we're training computers, uh, that, that we don't we don't let them make the same mistakes that we have in history. That we have to we have to set them on the right path. So you have to be very careful as a as a computer scientist, um, as someone who's training models, that you are not injecting the mistakes that uh, that that humans have made in the past. Okay, I'm coming to the end. I want to talk a little bit about what, what I think is coming next. Um, and, uh, and I think there's, there's just going to be this relentless drive towards reducing the barrier to entry of all this. And I hope that's one of the things that I've shown today, is that you can access some of these amazing tools very quickly and cheaply already. But I think it's just, that's going to get even lower. So um, last week, uh, this is a really interesting development from Uber. Uh, who've been quite, um, I mean, Uber, I think, are not, not an admirable company in many ways, but uh, they have been really one of their kind of, they've done a lot of interesting work in this field. And uh, last week they announced this tool, Ludwig, Ludwig, um, like Van Beethoven. And um, it's, a, it's a Python tool, so you can install Ludwig. And, and, what, and their claim for it is, as it says here, a code-free deep learning toolbox. And uh, really, this is trying to make it. It's, it's a tool that they've built internally that they've been using for the last two years within Uber to help their um, their data scientists immediately get answers from their data. So with Ludwig, you have a CSV file. So it would be similar to the example I showed before, the, the, the prediction engine for AWS. You have a CSV file, your data, and then you have a YAML file uh, where you describe the different categories, and then you just you you. That's all you need, and you tell the to go away, and, and the will try to use the right training model, and then it will try several training models, and it will evaluate the success, and it will, it will segment the training data, and it will do the kind of things that that, that we 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 learn to do as uh, as we work on machine learning, and it will just try and simplify those tasks for us. And I think this is going to be uh, a continuing trend: is that it's uh, uh, the decisions that we need to make will will reduce. And, and with that will come cost. So I haven't talked about the cost for all these services, but uh, there are, for, for Google and Amazon and Microsoft and IBM, and there are free tiers for all of these. And I think I, I have been you know, using and, and testing these applications for, for months, and I don't think I've been charged anything yet. But even when you do get charged, it's kind of, you know, it's, a, it's cents for, for, for thousands of requests. So it's um, very, very low cost already. Uh, there's also this change that I alluded to briefly around not just comprehension of data but generation of data, um, and this is uh, this is this is kind of really interesting, but also a little bit scary. I think um, last week there was this uh, post from Open OpenAI. Uh, I don't know if any of, any of you saw this. It was there was a lot of, kind of breathless coverage in the press because uh, OpenAI. Who's, who are, you know, as you would guess from their name, are, are supposed to be open about the, uh, the AI work that they're doing. They've decided not to release this new um, uh, engine for, for generating text because they say it's too good. And, and here's an example for it. So the, the, the job of this, of this engine is to, uh, it's, a, it's taking 40 gigabytes of text and analyze, and analyze it. And you know how in Gmail, as you start typing, it will kind of, you, you'll, you'll get an answer for you. And this is you know, something that you can immediately see a useful application for. Um, this engine is, is doing this in a very, very uh, impressive and accurate way. And uh, so in case you can't read this, um, it was given the prompt, recycling is good for the world. No, you could not be more wrong. And it created this next paragraph. Recycling is not good for the world. It's bad for the environment. It's bad for our health. It's bad for our economy. I'm not kidding. Recycling is not good for the environment. It's destructive to the earth, etc. Sounds a bit familiar. This is a tone of voice. I don't know if any of you recognise this. Uh, uh, um, but you know, I, I'm a bit torn on this. I, I think uh, it is strange that a company called AI wouldn't release this technology. But also, you can see that uh, you can imagine immediately. Some of the, the, the kind of the dangerous outcomes of this of this kind of technology, and similarly with the um, you know the, the face generation thing, and you know clearly cats have got a way to go yet, but um, at the moment it's, it's funny to see you know a face that's been made by a human, but the danger is that um, it's going to get harder and harder for us to to know what's true and what's fake, 
and uh, and we have to be more and more vigilant about about what what the world is telling us. And um, also, the, the last thing I would like to say is about machine learning at the edge. So, I mean, the, the examples I've been showing so far are all where you get your data and you send it off to the cloud and you get a response in 200 milliseconds. But increasingly, this stuff is happening closer to you, to the user. Um, this is an example. So I've got, not in my pocket, um, the new Google phone, the, the Pixel 3. And this is an example from the advertising, the new feature, Night Sight. Has anyone seen this? This is totally amazing. Isn't it? Actually, when this, when this advert came out, people mocked them because they thought this is, uh, it was, you know, they, they faked this. But it, it's as good as it seems. And basically, the way it works is um, uh, you take a photo in a, in a situation with almost no light, and in the background, it takes 100 photos. And then it will, um, and then using a, a new chip, which is optimized for visual processing, it will. It will use the kind of the small movements of my hand. It's because because of the small movements of my hand and the, the like shifting light during the photo, there'll be little bits of data that vary across across each of the hundred images, and then it will use all those hundred images to to work out what it could have seen if, if there'd been enough light. It's, and it's totally extraordinary results. And and so that's an example of how these chips are kind of getting faster and more efficient and happening right on the edge, so in our phones and in our devices, which is another interesting development, I think. So that's it. Uh, I would say if you, uh, a lot of you, I think, know a lot about machine learning, and, and I'm sure a lot more than me. If you don't, and so you want to learn it, then I really recommend the book by Francois Cholet, uh, Deep Learning with Python. And then Kaggle is an amazing resource for getting these these data sets and playing with them. But I guess the the the, the, the point of, of my talk is that it's it's great if you want to learn that stuff and um, and you know and and if you do you'll probably be uh, an important player in this scary world of the next 30 years where we have to uh, judge how to deal with all these huge changes in our civilization but you don't have to if if you just want to build amazing new different types of apps now you can just you can do them already with the kind of 10 lines of code that I demonstrated that allow you to hook into these into these web services and take advantage. And it's, it's a kind of a surprising thing because I guess we this is race for all the, the big cloud providers to um, to get better and better at uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning, and um, and you know presumably to kind of achieve world dominance. But uh, it's, uh, it's one of the positive outcomes of it is that they are commoditizing these services in, in a quite a surprising and unexpected way. And for me, it feels like I mean I'm. I'm older than almost all of you, and I remember really when, when the web came and, and this this feeling that how it um, suddenly democratized ability to, to talk to everybody else and to uh, to make an impact. And then the same thing kind of happened with AWS and cloud services, where before you needed to kind of get a big bank loan or uh, or get some investment in order to, to build a new product, and now you just need to you know get the free tier and spin up some servers and, 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 and it feels like this is another way of that. So these services are here now and the only thing that limits you in order to, it limits you coming up with this, some incredible new idea is just your imagination. So the, the technology is all there for you in the same way that they are with these other things. And if you have the right idea, you can hook into them with some pretty with the with the with the basic Python skills that you already have and build something amazing. And I hope you do. Thank you very much.